to uh, our webinar, our first event that gathers uh, our clients from all the Nordic countries. Uh, my name is Katarzyna Kompowska. I'm uh, in charge of uh, one of the six regions of uh, COFAS, uh, the region Northern Europe, uh, uh, which is uh, Germany, the Netherlands and the Nordic countries. So first of all, let me give you a few words about our Nordic operations. Uh, as you might be aware of, uh, uh, mid 2020, um, COFAS um, acquired the GIEC credit insurance um, in Norway. And uh, with this acquisition, we are now present in all the Nordic countries. Yeah. Uh, and we have strengthened our expertise, our market position in the region and we have an ambitious uh, growth plan for the region. Now we have a true Nordic organization, uh, as many of you, as many of our clients, and uh, we want to become an important partner for you for risk management, both in export and uh, in domestic trade. Many things are happening now in COFAS Nordics uh, on our growth journey. And uh, of course, we uh, all look also forward to be able to meet you again, to meet you in uh, your office, to meet you in our offices. We are implementing now in Nordics, but uh, also in other countries of COFAS, our Build to Lead strategic plan with the main ambition to become a leader in our industry. But a leader means for us not the biggest, but the best. We want to be the best expert in risk management. We want to be the best in providing an excellent client service. We want to be the best in providing good solutions to manage uh, the trade risk. So you have probably noticed that uh, we grew in Nordics, uh, not only uh, through the recent acquisition, but also we, we have attracted new great experts in many countries. We have strengthened our operational teams and we keep investing and developing our tools and solutions. So one highlight here, as you know, we manage uh, as COFAS, uh, uh, we manage worldwide over 500 billion exposure, trade credit exposure in more than 200 countries. And uh, we manage this uh, uh, using the, the best information having access to millions of data with daily updates on payment defaults, on important changes, uh, uh, using the best predictive models to uh, assess the risks. We decided uh, mm, end of last year to launch a new offer, the business information solutions, sharing with you, uh, our clients, uh, extremely valuable data and information on companies worldwide information we also use uh, in the management of our risks. So I think it speaks also for the quality. And this information is available now uh, through our new tool uh, icon. So our business information service uh, offer ranges from providing full reports to providing predictive scores. So Nordics have uh, had a very good start with this new product. So I hope that the solution can add value to your business uh, too. So uh, I wanted with this uh, small advertising uh, um, to uh, make you interested in this offer because I'm strongly convinced that uh, it uh, completes uh, very well our uh, uh, credit insurance offer. And this is also a very powerful tool to manage your suppliers or clients' risks. And as it is something new on the market, uh, uh, it was also important to me to, to mention this today. Uh, closing my short introduction, I think that uh, you probably wonder uh, that I did not make any reference until now to the um, economic environment, to the um, unprecedented times we are all going through. We will hear about it more in a few seconds from uh, uh, my colleague, our economist Christiane von Berg. But um, what I want to underline here is I want to thank you all for your trust cooperation. It's very important for us to give you in these times the best service and support you. I have, we have, in order to do this, we have to be much closer to you now. We have to understand much better what's going on in your businesses 
and give you also a much better understanding of our actions and of our assessments. The collaboration is a value which is uh, uh, in current uh, times and environment much more important than ever. So I'm very happy that you also joined our meeting today to hear about uh, our analysis of the situation. We want ESCOFAS to stay transparent, to communicate more and to stay close to you and together navigate uh, through these uh, unusual times. So with this said, I uh, leave the floor to uh, Christiane von Berg, uh, economist for our region, Northern Europe, uh, who will give us an update uh, on uh, what's going on in the global economy, what are the most important economic trends. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Kompowska. Hello, everybody. Uh, one short comment uh, again to everybody. Please take down your video so that the line will be free for our presentation. That would be very uh, helpful. Thank you very much. Um, again, hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here uh, right now. I am sitting actually in Germany and uh, waving over to you in the Nordics. Um, and uh, I am really looking forward to this new presentation that I brought to you with me. And to be honest, I thought that uh, in the last months you will have probably heard so much about your own country, about your own region, what's going on in Europe. And then I thought, OK, maybe I should give at least at one of our webinars little bit of change and and show you what's going on in the rest of the world because that is something that right now um, is going far away and I thought it would be helpful if you have a view also what's going on in the emerging markets what's going on in Asia and Latin America so that you have at least a, a general view in the next webinars I promise we will come back to Europe again so uh, that you have a little bit of change with COFAS. We start with the emerging markets and uh, well, most of the times we start with some GDP numbers. So how was the year 2020 and how is in our view uh, the outlook for 2021? And um, I have prepared some of the major emerging markets or I tried to give you some examples from different regions. And as you see, well, pff, 2020, of course, was uh, a very bad year. I think everybody knows that. That's not a, a secret or something else for many countries like, for example, uh, India, but also Mexico um, or especially Croatia. This was the strongest recession since and now hold on to your seats 1946. So it was the strongest recession since one year after the end of World War II. I mean, nobody of us can remember it, but um, we we have all seen the pictures, so it was really devastating. And uh, and that is something that we have to keep in mind when we talk now about economic development, etc. Because in the Nordics, um, well, most of the Nordics, um, it was really um, yeah a recession, but not as strong. I mean, it was the strongest recession since around 2009. But for the rest of the world, it was definitely a stronger impact. And that's something, again, that we have to keep in mind. You will see we have two different countries where it looks, well, there is no recession really in, um, in 2020. And that's uh, China and Turkey. Well, is it or is it not Turkey? Uh, no, we start with China. China, um, China is a country with 1.3 billion people. And this means they have still a very strong growth potential. So in normal times, uh, we would have seen growth rates around 7%, 7.5%. In the last years already, we had a slowdown in economic development, around 6%. And they were not really happy about it. But yeah, that's, that's the thing when you have a, an economy that is maturing more and more. So when you look now at this, 2.3%, this is a recession in Chinese terms. So everybody you can ask in China, 2.3%, that's really, really low. So you have to think of what is the potential of an economy and what has happened. The other thing is Turkey. 
well, Turkey, we have a plus of 1.8%. That is good, of course, and uh, therefore we cannot say that there was a recession there. However, we have to remind, be reminded that 2019 there was already a big recession and these are growth developments from one country to another. And that means that, yeah, well, if you had already a recession, then it's not as easy to go to the next year of a recession, but uh, that you have an increase. And uh, we will come to that in the next slide where we have a closer look on what has happened there. But yes, we have a, a positive growth dynamic in 2020 for Turkey and also in the expectation for 2021. For most, we have an, uh, an increase here, which is um, in general OK. Um, so we haven't recovered here. The question remains um, maybe that we have to downgrade it again because of the development of the pandemic. And again, we will come to that later on. This is the first overview. On the right hand side of the slide, you will see the um, COFAS forecast for the world GDP. And there you can actually see that 2020 was really exceptional in its recession compared uh, to 29, 29, yeah, 2009. That's that sounds better. 2009. Um, again, for the Nordics, um, it would have been something like that here. So definitely not as strong as 2009, but for the rest of the world it was. And uh, again, it is a very uh, strong downward development, but we expect a strong recovery. Please be reminded, these are not levels. It doesn't mean that at the end of 2021, we are definitely above the level that, levels that we have seen in the past. These are growth rates. That means, yes, we have a strong growth rate, but we need a strong growth rate to get out of this mud and and uh, progress in a, in a positive way. So I said we will go to the details of what has happened in 2020 in several uh, emerging markets and that's what you can see here in this next slide. But what do you see here actually? Well I thought okay um, maybe we want to know where are we right now at the end of 2020. The first uh, growth numbers I think for Q1 would just released but not uh, but only for i think china so we will have a look uh, for all of them for q4 2020 and what i did it's quite simple i just take all the growth numbers uh and base them on q4 2019 to zero or well in that term up to 100 and then i go from there and what you can see is uh, it looks um like modern art <laughs> But uh, I, I hope that we can manage to get through it together. So um, here we have the first uh, quarter and there I think China in, in green sticks out because um, China was really impacted at the very first beginning because it was the origin of the pandemic. Um, and you see, yes, this is a strong decrease, one of the, well, the strongest actually in all of these countries. But then there is already a, a progression above the 100 line means that in Q2 we were already in the growth level above the one of the uh, of the pre-COVID time, and then um, there was a smooth growth rate here. Uh, others like uh, Vietnam were impacted a lot because they are exporting a lot to China. So general and similar development except that this recovery didn't take place in the way that it was in China. It took definitely longer, but still Vietnam is now in the uh, positive growth area too. And here we have the miracle of Turkey where you think, OK, what has happened there? I mean, how can they just like cling, go into the growth dynamic? And the reason here is loans. So uh, President Erdogan introduced a no, new program together with the central bank so that he's, he forced actually the president of the central bank to lower his uh, key interest rate as much as he can. Um, we have seen that in the past several times. If the central bank president is not abiding to it, he get fired. It's a little bit like in the Trump administration in the last years. If you don't do what the chef wants, then you get fired <laughs> and the next one is introduced. And that's what's happening right now in the central bank of Turkey. Sorry to say that. 
Um, and then they introduced a loan program. So this growth dynamic is built on loans. In general, this could be good, but only then when you have a strong economy that has a short recession and where you can bridge this short recession via loans that you can pay back then later. That's uh, the normal, normal Keynesian uh, economic theory. That's OK. But when you see how uh, the Turkish economy was evolving before coming from a big recession, then you would think, OK, this loan is nothing more than a firework. It goes up. It is spectacular. You have spectacular growth rates, but at the end it will vanish and then you are at the same position where you were before. And that's probably something that we see in Turkey. So that is why we expect for uh, 2021 to still have this dynamic uh, that we have uh, from from this uh, from this recovery here. But we do not expect in the following years that it will progress like the one that you see here. So to sum up, um, strong developments and um, to give you a little bit of a comparison, I added here in gray this gray line. This is the Eurozone. So you can actually see that there are some countries like uh, South Africa, India, uh, but also what is that? That's Mexico. They had a stronger recession. Yes, definitely. But uh, in the end, in Q4, they were still a tiny bit above uh, the European um, development. To give you a short view on, on the Nordics or to give you a short example, uh, I can show you what the Nordics look like. They look like that, that and are here, not above the 100, but definitely above everything that we see from the Eurozone. So um, they are actually the primus of the Eurozone or the EU because not uh, because most are not part of the Eurozone, but the development is the same more or less. So I said uh, we we see here something a, a stronger development in Asia like China and Vietnam. And where does it come from? And I thought that's why we uh, just go and have a look at uh, at emerging Asia. Um, where we have on the left hand side the activity in the two different main sectors. Uh, services manufacturing. Uh, manufacturing is here in uh, blue, services in green, and that's the Q3 the comparison 2020 to 2019. 2019. Well, um, and what you can see here is that we have only a few countries where we have growth dynamic in both parts. And this is Vietnam, Taiwan, China. Everybody else has either a good development in in one and not in the other, or both are not very well. You can see it here, uh, Thailand, Korea a bit, which is surprising from my perspective, I think, uh, India and Malaysia, and also Singapore here on the right hand side. So what is going on with manufacturing? Um, well, there is a big, big topic right now um, which is has also an impact on exports the exports you can see here on on um, the right side you can see this are the january february numbers in the comparison and we took here actually 2021 which are the news <coughs> well bless you <laughs> uh, versus 2019 why? Because uh, in Asia, the, the pandemic already began in January 2020, and we wanted to see how it is bef uh, in comparison to the pre-COVID times. And what you can see here is that Vietnam, China, Hong Kong a bit, but Hong Kong, please take Hong Kong out, out because Hong Kong is a lot of reinvestment from China. Taiwan and India are doing quite well, and the reason behind this is that they are in general, strong in manufacturing and especially in chip production. Chip production is right now this running trend all over. We have a very strong um, demand for it in automotive, in um, different other manufacturing subsectors, and um, that's what's running right now. Manufacturing in general, 
general, but especially chip manufacturing. The whole process of the recovery depends really on what you are producing and where you are sending it. That's the main part. And of course, in which sector you are good at, which is combined, of course. And that's something that you can see here. Uh, where we just had a look on the world market of different sectors and see how they evolved in 2020. And uh, here's we, we have here the comparison again, Q4 2020 to Q4 2019. And uh, we have here on, on, the, on this axis the turnover development. So have the turnover decreased or increased? I think it's no surprise that most of them have a turnover decrease. And uh, the net debt ratio, so how has the debt developed in uh, the last uh, year? And uh, well, I think what's quite clear is that here textile clothing is doing really bad because, well, first of all, uh, production came to, um, to stop at the beginning of the pandemic and then the demand decreases a lot. I don't know when you were uh, last shopping, maybe, um, when you are from Sweden, you have actually the possibility to go shopping more in shops. But um, for example, here in Germany, due to lockdowns, um, shops are closed, non-essential shops are closed since mid-December and haven't really opened yet. So uh, you can see that, um, and as we are working from home office, there is not so much the need to, to buy new clothes. You cannot go out to clubs and, and, and show yourself like like flushing up and, and show yourself that's nothing that you can do right now. So the demand for clothes has definitely decreased a lot. Um, interesting part here maybe is retail. Retail um, has a decrease in, in turnover, but not in debt. And, and here the main thing is that, of course, in retail supermarkets are included. So while and e-commerce too. So while we have, of course, a decrease in all stationary shops um, all over the world, please remember this is the world market. We have, of course, an increase in supermarkets who are doing very, very well and also in e-commerce. And this is balancing out a lot of that. One interesting point is this little thing here, ICT. ICT stands for Information and Communication Technology. You will probably wonder why uh, this is here with some decrease in, in turnover and um, not so much changed in debt. Because before I said, hey, chip manufacturing is really the thing right now. Well, the thing is that these are the numbers for 2020 where the chip demand increased more and more, but um, really came to a top at the end of the year. The second part is that uh, IT is also used in a lot of machinery and in a lot of office needed and for example printers and as many people in the world are right now working from home the demand for printers is low and as many companies have to struggle right now with their liquidity the demand for new investments into, into machinery or into IT development in this machinery is not as high as it would have been in other times. And this is balancing out each other so that uh, ICT is um, has a small decrease in turnover compared to Q4 2019. That's the world market. And uh, when we were just at Asia, I thought uh, to, to make it complete, I cannot go without telling you a little bit about the uh, Chinese uh, new five year plan. As you know, they always have five year plans. They are definitely more stricter than I am. I can't manage to do a one year plan. They do a five year plan. But this one is a little bit different. Uh, normally they give really um, growth targets and somehow miraculously they will actually match these growth targets. That's nothing that they did. They had said that this year they uh, expect a growth above 6%. You maybe remember our forecast was 7.5%, so this is manageable. They want 11 million new jobs. This sounds for us spectacular for sure, but please remember we are talking about 1.3 billion people, so that's manageable too. But beside of that, they have no 
for their new set targets. They just say they want a sustainable growth. And that shows you that China is more and more coming from emerging country to a more maturing country where you cannot say really, OK, the growth rates will be as spectacular as they now have to invest into um, more efficient use of the existing capital instead of producing new capital. Like um, at one point, all streets are set and then you have to see how you can efficiently use these new streets and not put new streets on, um, on the landscape. Um, they want more growth through consumption, which is typically for maturing countries and um, they were less dependence on foreign countries. That's actually something that we have to be reminded here in Europe. In Europe, we export a lot of machinery, uh, but also automotive parts to China. And um, China is now changing this a bit. They want to do more and more by themselves, so they get more and more independent from us. And um, yeah, that can be tricky in the future for us because this is a main, um, main export business, especially for, for France and, and Germany, um, but also uh, on um, but uh, also on the, the supply industry coming to France and Germany. So speaking of that, uh, Denmark, for example, will be affected by that probably too. Um, and then a stronger focus on services and green investment, which is the trend all over the world. That's what we all do. So um, this is also part of it. OK, so when we look at 2021, we have said it is very important uh, what you are producing and which part you are. We said that uh, Asia and especially China as a growth um, engine is more and more going away or more and more doing their own things so that it has less and less drive for us here in Europe. But then there is, of course, the pandemic, which is very important for our view on 2021, um, because uh, as you all know, if we are in lockdown, nothing can really progress. And uh, from the Swedish pr perspective, yes, if you are not in the lockdown, then you are very lucky. But on the other side, if you are exporting and if you are looking for tourism, it is very important what's going on around your country too. And um, again, the pandemic is here in main important point. So I thought I'd give you a little bit of a view on what's happening in the emerging markets in terms of uh, the pandemic. Probably you haven't seen that because uh, I mean, most of us know the numbers of our own country, but not the ones of our neighbors and especially not of the others. So uh, let's look at um, India and Turkey, where you can definitely see that we are here again um, at a strong development and point in, in the next wave. Um, so how you should read that the blue line are the deaths per day. The green one is the new cases per day. And we start at January 2020 and um, then go, go far away. This last level was the level of last Friday. So, of course, between the days, times are changing. But what you can see is that, for example, in India, there were no time where we had higher cases per day. And that's, uh, of course, a very important point. And you, please look here, we have different scales, of course. We are here at 150,000 per day. That's that's really important. Turkey also at a very high, especially also in deaths. So there is really a, a, a very strong pressure to do something. While, um, OK, no, wait, uh, we go here. Brazil, the same situation. Um, again, strong death numbers uh, and Chile also on the rising, however, not as not as uh, strong in the level as in the others. Then we have Russia and the United Ameri uh, Arabian Emirates. Both are quite good in vaccination. Russia has its own uh, vaccine called uh, Sputnik V, uh, v and uh, and uh, the United Arabian Emirates have 
already reserved a lot of BioNTech Pfizer uh, products, so they are um, vaccinating a lot. We will see that in the next slide. So they are more and more taking the numbers down. And then we have China and South Africa. Believe it or not, China has an own vaccine. Yeah, that's for sure. However, uh, my colleague from China told me they are not vac vaccinating as much. The reason why the numbers is flat and with flat we say, OK, there are five cases per day, so nothing, um, is the strong um, the strong quarantine rules in, in China. So it's not that they have vaccinated already so much, but that they have really the pandemic under control due to the strong quarantine rules. If you are in quarantine there, you have really, I, I promise you, no chance at all to, to leave the quarantine ever. Um, and because of this strong surveillance. And that's something interesting here because they managed even without um, without so much vaccination to get it under control so that life can go on in China. And in South Africa, somehow this has happened here too. The numbers are again very low compared to others, although uh, again they are not that far in vaccination and they are actually not that strong in, in, um, in um, quarantine, maybe it has something to do that people are far away from each other and uh, the heat of the country will probably help. But um, these are some ports that, uh, that are quite interesting. And here we go to the vaccination numbers, which I think um, are very interesting. One first point, um, I have added um, the Nordic countries be because I think it's helpful for you to have a good comparison how the others are compared to you. And maybe um, you will see numbers that are maybe not so familiar to you, but um, please have a look at fully. What does fully mean? <laughs> so for me, it is important to know when everybody has the full um, protection due to the uh, vaccination, which means uh, for if you are still using AstraZeneca two shots, if you're using BioNTech, two shots. Um, so these or Moderna is one shot. And I think these are the ones who are used more or less in, in most parts of the world. So for me, it is important when everybody has the two shots. So I'm only counting the two shots. I know that you have several countries, for example, in Finland, we know it, that uh, that are using, that are right now um, giving a lot of first shots. And then later on, after these uh, three months in between, they're going to the second um, to the second shot. And that's only the, the point where I actually count them in these numbers. So um, that's why uh, maybe you will find your own country a little bit lower. Um, nevertheless, the progress is on the way. But for me right now, it's only important when you have two shots, because for me, it's important to know when the lockdown ends for your country. And when you look at the numbers, it's quite interesting that, of course, United, the United States are very far uh, uh, on the first line. And uh, actually, this is not the, the complete order. I just took out some, some examples. So there are other countries in between, but um, actually already the second one here is India. And then already UK, which is quite interesting. Brazil and Turkey. Turkey, you can see they are really good in vaccination. So that's something that President Erdogan can do very well. Indonesia, Russia, and then we have here China, uh, Germany and already Chile. So main point, Brazil, Chile, they are really good in vaccination in terms of general numbers. And then here is already Israel um, and so on. We have here some Nordic countries, which um, actually, if you would take all the countries in the world, you are still on the upper part because it goes down, 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 down. We have uh, many, many where there are no um, vaccination numbers uh, until now. So that is still good. But when you look at the numbers, for example, um, here are some major emerging countries who are doing really well. Nevertheless, we have to think of how much is this in the share of the population and there Times things are changing. It's a little bit like in the Bible. The last ones will be the first ones. Gibraltar with 30 
um, thousand um, are then with 90% vaccination. Uh, followed by Israel, Chile, the United States, and here the United Arabian Emirates, which I said uh, quite far already in, in the vaccination part, and then it goes down. There's one state where we already have 100% vaccination, and that's the Vatican. Uh, beside of that, no country has reached until now the 100. And Gibraltar, well, it's not an own country, but we, will, we see it here as a region, is at least on the way, but Gibraltar is really small, so that's easy. Nevertheless, I said, OK, um, the vaccination process is a big part. The other thing is in between, between the time where we are right now and when we are fully vaccinated so that people can go out um, no matter what, we have still some problems like, like lock lockdowns. And what's about the, um, what about the companies that uh, are there? in between they cannot work for example shops are closed um you cannot uh, bars are closed cafes are closed uh, some hairdressers in some countries are, are closed so what about them and the main thing is that you have two support measures that you can have you can have fiscal political support and monetary support and here the inequality between emerging countries and developed countries is coming up a lot. So while here we still see that in terms of vaccination, there are at least some emerging markets who are doing very well. Uh, of course, you do not see uh, all the others who are doing not that well, uh, but you can see that there are still at least some who are doing very well. But uh, when it comes to, uh, to monetary support, it is not that way. And that's something that we see here. So how much have actually the states in state aid spent in the last year? And here's the comparison, developing countries worthy, uh, versus already advanced or emerging markets versus advanced economies. Here on the left-hand side, the advanced economies, uh, where you can see here in, in uh, dark blue, uh, the subsidies and real payments, and then on top all the loans and guarantees and equities that the government has offered to their companies. So that means that um, this this um, this blue line is definitely in the budget included, and the rest can be repaid or not. Um, and this whole support at 24% of the GDP. That's uh, that's a lot that's the bazooka um here um, these are this is the structure of all advanced economies and you can see that over 10 percent around 12 percent of the gdp are just paid in subsidies and the rest um a little bit less than a half are, um, are additional equities loans etc japan is the one who's doing the most here in terms of, of total support when it comes to it. But when you look at, at the money spent, it's Singapore and the US who are doing the most here. While on the other side, look at the developed markets or emerging markets, that's not that much. On average, they spend 6.1% because they do not have the money. I mean, uh, it all depends on where was your, um, your national debt before and can you refinance yourself in later on and that's something that you can see here um, in, in terms of emerging markets brazil is here on the top we will come to it uh, in a second followed by turkey but by turkey it's most equity loans and guarantees and i mean for guarantees it is the hope that you get your uh, money back and um, and it is more like an insurance not that much the direct payment um, and here again, emerging economies is the structure. So we have on in general, on average, uh, a bit more um, money directly spent uh, than equity and loans, but still 6.1% is really not the world. That's a very good support program for a normally uh, advanced country, but it's far away from a bazooka. And the reason for that is something that you can see in Latin America, well, we have already a lot of debt. And uh, if you want to 
increase your debt. Uh, so first of all, here, this is the debt. This is 2019, this is 2020, and this is the fiscal stimulus for 2020. Um, this has the scale of the right-hand side and the rest, the left-hand side. So when you look here at Peru and Chile, they are definitely below the 60%. Ecuador is still very well. Colombia, Mexico have still room here, although they do not use that much the room. When you look 1% of GDP in fiscal support, that's uh, <laughs> nothing. Um, while we have here Brazil and Argentina who do not have actually that much the room. Argentina, please be reminded, has defaulted last year. Again, they default every five years on average, I think in the last 200 years. So that means that if you want to take up your debt via government uh, bonds, then you have to pay really a very, very high interest rate. And the question is, is actually somebody uh, taking these government bonds or have you even to increase um, the 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 interest rates or the the um, the churn back of this of this government bonds and that's something quite striking which is really strong in comparison to for example nordics or or uh, germany where you get government where you can buy government bonds but you get an interest rate that is around zero so uh, that's quite nice for the government. They can have debt and uh, maybe even get uh, paid to, to offer this debt. While in Argentina and Brazil, they really have high uh, interest rates to pay for these, these government bonds. So the scope for maneuver is really low in 2021, when already in 2020 we had this increase, there is not so much room to do it in 2021. And um, that's why we see that the recovery is definitely not so dynamic in, in comparison to normal terms than in other countries because the uh, support from the state is missing. The other thing is, do the um, central banks have still room for maneuver? And there are actually not that many in emerging markets who still have room for maneuver when you are looking at uh, central banks, well, the easing is the easiest via the interest rates. You can uh, decrease the interest rate. However, therefore you need space to decrease it. And there are only these countries which are marked here with, uh, with this magenta, with this uh, pink, um, that have actually an interest rate that is above 0.25% in the real interest rate. So, uh, excluding the um, the inflation rate, that was the word, the inflation rate. Then the second point, are um, these e uh, currencies actually floating? So are they not uh, in a pack with, for example, the US dollar or the euro? So with, when there is a pack, then the central bank cannot, has no room for maneuver to do their own central bank policy. It's the same with Denmark. Denmark, the Danish crown has a, a pack with the euro. So the Danish central bank has to mirror more or less the, government, uh, the monetary policy of the ECB. And that's the same here with other um, emerging market um, currencies, which are packed mostly to the US dollar. Um, that is true for everything that is white. Everything that is purple here has their own central bank policy, so they can do actually something. However, then there is the factor if you are decreasing it, the, uh, um, you are um, uh, there's a depression fac factor on your currency. And uh, then the question is, can you pay your current account deficit anymore? And if you want to pay it, it has to be, or it can, the deficit cannot be too too high. Like uh, it has to be below minus three percent. Is this a case? Yes. Here, no. Yes. 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 So they have at least a current account that is above minus three percent, and then you need the reserves of the currency in which you are uh, have debt. And the question is, do you have enough reserves? So if you have everything of these four factors, then you have monetary policy leeway, then you have room for maneuver. 
And where is this actually the case? Well, it is the case in Indonesia and Mexico and in Russia. In no other, uh, in no other country, you have all these different factors fulfilled, which means that first, you do not you have not room that much to maneuver in the fiscal policy and second, not in the monetary policy either. And this brings, of course, a lot of political risk with each other. You have still the pandemic going on. You cannot work. You do not get any support anymore. And income is going out, is, is, is more and more going into this, this scissor dynamic. The ones who were rich, get more rich. The ones who didn't have anything, they get even lower. And that's something that you can see here um, as one of my uh, last slides. Uh, our COFAS political and society uh, fragility index, uh, which is here on this scale. So the higher you are, the, the stronger is um, this political risk factor or the higher it is. That means that the Iran Kazakhstan, United Arabian Emirates, but also Angola are the ones who, who we have really in mind. OK, what's going on there? Can there be coming a conflict? And then the Gini coefficient, which shows you the higher the Gini coefficient, the stronger is the scissor between the income um, inequality. And uh, South Africa is unfortunately here leading. So while the numbers of the pandemic are right now again low, things are doing are, are OK. But whenever the pandemic goes up again, then we really have a problem in South Africa because the support is not there. We, we have no room for support anymore. Um, the, the inequality in the population is very high and uh, we have another pandemic um, coming on with more p dying people. This is really a, a an environment where political risks are increasing a lot. And that's something that, of course, we have in mind when we are doing our country risk assessment. And that's all from my side now. I give back to Helle and I am looking for your questions. Then, first of all, thanks a lot to all the participants. It is very nice to uh, have this opportunity to meet uh, in, in a form like this as a webinar. Also, uh, a warm thanks to, to Kajishina Kampowska and Christiane von Berg. It's very nice uh, for you to spend your time here in, in the Nordics as, uh, as these webinars. And we, of course, look forward to have you back again when we come back from our holidays. So to all of you, uh, I would say let's stay in contact because it is changing times. Uh, we have a lot of things in front of us, both uh, on uh, reopening plans and the corona effect and also hopefully the possibilities to meet very soon physically in our offices around the Nordics. So that will be a very thing, very good thing to look forward to. And hopefully around our summer holidays, we will be able to meet again. L let's hope that because it also means a lot to our economies in the Nordics that we can start opening again and continue our business. So let's stay in close contact, all of us with our contact persons and share opinions and ideas and also, uh, of course, what is happening in the world around us. So thanks a lot to everyone and we really look forward to meet you all again. And have a nice day.